Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Damon. Uh, and thank you to Kaiser Health News. We're really pleased to be here this morning. The Johnny Hartford Foundation is especially pleased to support today's event focused on inclusive care at the end of life and your reporting desk, which covers aging and health issues across the board. I'm Ronnie Snyder, as uh, Damon mentioned. I'm the program director at the John A. Hartford Foundation. It is a nonpartisan national philanthropy that's based in New York City. So it was established in 1929 by the family benefactors of the A&P uh, grocery chain, and our mission is to improve the care of older adults. The John A. Hartford Foundation works in three programmatic areas, building age-friendly health systems, supporting family caregivers, and improving serious illness end-of-life care. And so while, while end-of-life care is today's topic, we know that in each of our priority areas, there's a really pressing need for more inclusive, more culturally competent, competent care for LGBTQ older adults and their families. And this year, this topic is particularly worth celebrating because this year, next month actually, is the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising, known as the birth of the modern LGBTQ movement. That's why the John A. Hartford Foundation is supporting some projects such as one that we have supported with the Diverse Elders Coalition to conduct research and to also develop educational training programs for healthcare and social service organizations in order to better meet the needs of diverse elders. That includes family caregivers, that includes their partners, that includes spouses and friends in the LGBTQ community who are family caregivers for older adults. SAGE is represented on today's panel and we thank them for their partnership uh, in the coalition and in that project in particular. We believe that an age-friendly health system is also an LGBTQ health-friendly uh, system, including for people who are facing serious illness and end of life. Whether by in improving clinician training, by enacting better policies, or simply by helping to bring these issues mm, out of the closet, so to speak, we want to better address the challenges and the concerns and also the opportunities that we'll be hearing about from this excellent panel that I'm really excited to hear from. So we thank Kaiser Health News. We thank all of our presenters in advance for this um, really interesting and, and important uh, conversation. And we thank everybody in the audience as well for having this discussion today and for continuing this, this discussion into the future. So next, I'm going to hand it over to Janelle uh, Alicia, who is a senior correspondent for KHN. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Warm introduction, and thank you all for coming uh, today. It's so nice to have a full house to talk about these really important issues. Um, I'm really gratified to see this panel here. They were all very kind in our conversations previously um, to agree to spend their time. So we have we are fortunate to have a diverse panel of people with a wide range of personal and professional experience about their end of life an end of life issue that's very rarely addressed. And uh, that's how LGBTQ people are treated when they're dealing with serious or terminal illness or need care at the end of life. Uh, let me introduce the panel now. Uh, first, to my immediate right is Joe Wardinsky. Uh, Joe is counsel at Relman, Dane & Colfax, a national civil rights firm based here in DC. He is co-counsel on Walsh versus Friendship Village, which is a Fair Housing Act case challenging a St. Louis area senior living community's refusal to allow Mary Walsh and Bev Nance, a married same-sex couple, to live in their community because of their relationship. Very interesting case. Um, we'll have another panelist here uh, from AARP, Ni Cordelai Corte. He should be here any minute. Um, and he is uh, AARP's senior advisor and national LGBT liaison. He's not here yet, okay. Um, then we have Aaron Tax. Many of you may know Aaron. Aaron is Director of Advocacy for SAGE, Advocacy and Services for LGBT el Elders. He advocates for LGBT inclusive federal aging policies that account for the unique needs of LGBT older adults. 
Next, we have Sean Squires. Uh, Sean is the team director for Seasons Hospice and Palliative Care of Maryland, one of more than 300 providers nationwide to receive SAGE certification for LGBT care. Then we have Kim Aquaviva. Uh, Kim is a tenured professor in the George Washington University School of Nursing and, and the author of the 2017 book, LGBTQ Inclusive Hospice and Palliative Care, A Practical Guide to Transforming Professional Practice. On August 1st, she will be joining the University of Virginia School of Nursing in an endowed professorship. She is the wife and caregiver of Kathy Brandt, um, who is dying of ovarian cancer. Um, Kathy is founder of the KB Group, a palliative care consulting firm in Washington, D.C. She is writer and editor of the National Consensus Project's Clinical Practice Guidelines for Quality Palliative Care, the most recent edition, and a former leader at the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization. She is the wife of Kimberly and was diagnosed this year with ovarian cancer and is here to share her prof professional and personal experience. And the photos that you saw coming in uh, were from a story that I was fortunate enough to talk uh, to Kathy and Kim for, where they shared their, their story about choosing aggressive palliative care um, at the end of life. So um, first of all, I know this room is full of advocates and people with great interest in this topic. So I wonder if you can just, with a show of hands, tell me how many of you have witnessed or experienced discrimination involving older or ill LGBTQ people? A fair number have directly experienced that. And then, obviously, because you're here, but how many of you are concerned that that can happen um, to LGBTQ people? Yeah, the whole room, really, of course. Um, and the conversation that we're going to have is, is for professionals and people who are very familiar with these issues, but we're also hoping through our Facebook live stream and um, through the coverage, we're going to run a story about this afterwards, to um, bring the issues that many of you may be familiar with to a wider audience. And so uh, we're going to start with um, one, of the, one of the most uh, basic, interesting questions, which is when we're talking about LGBTQ people, um, it can be difficult to even understand how many people that is, and there are some specific reasons why. Um, SAGE estimates that by 2030, about 7 million LGBTQ people will be older than 50 in the U.S., and about 4.7 million will need care or services, so a large and growing number of people. But that's an estimate, and the figures, as I was reporting, varied widely. So I wanted to ask Aaron, um, can you explain why is it so difficult to know how many people we're talking about? Sure. Uh, I think there are a number of factors here, but first and foremost, uh, many of you may have heard uh, the census being in the news a lot lately uh, about a, a question about citizenship status. But one thing that we've forgotten is that there was some level of expectation that uh, 2020 might be the first year in which LGBT folks might be counted in the census. And while that was not guaranteed and not certainty uh, with an incoming different administration, that's certainly not the case in this administration. And we that was one of the first things the Trump administration did do was put a stop to any collection of LGBT data in the census. And um, I should note, that's not the only place the Trump administration is trying to erase the LGBT people. Even at SAGE, we are working on a, a situation where uh, early in the administration, the Trump administration um, tried to, or mostly successfully removed an LGBT question from a survey called the National Survey of Older Americans Act Participants. Mm -hmm. And that's a survey that measures the efficacy of federally funded aging programs funded by the Older Americans Act. The Obama administration had included that LGBT question in the survey, and the Trump administration made one change and one change only to the survey that's more than 100 pages long because they said it was too burdensome, which was the removal of the LGBT question. We fought back along with our allies and got LGB put back in, but unfortunately the administration, I guess it's pretty obvious, really does not like transgender people and has succeeded in keeping that question out. So even the question about um, people defining their relationship as same sex or opposite sex is, is scrapped from the 2020 census? So my understanding uh, uh, from experts who work on this at the Williams Institute and other institutions that work in the data space is that they are able to piece together data from the American Community Survey, kind of the longer right. version of the census, mm -hmm. and based on data of same-sex households and the gender 
uh, of the participants in the American Community Survey, they're able to piece together same-sex households. The challenge with that data, however, is that we find that LGBT older folks are disproportionately single, mm -hmm. and that's not going to count any of those folks. Right. Very difficult to get an idea, even of the community that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, as I was doing the reporting that I was doing uh, around the story I wrote about Kim and Kathy and some other reporting, it was a surprise to me to talk to people who, who were genuinely surprised themselves to hear that discrimination exists in long-term care settings or in care settings at all regarding LGBTQ people. Um, the answer uh, was, we treat everybody the same. We're caring <laughs> and we treat everyone the same. Um, so Kim wrote an entire book uh, to serve as a practical guide for caregivers to offer inclusive care. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the types of discrimination we're talking about, and uh, both kind of covert, overt discrimination. Sure. Yeah. So I think you know the, the most common thing that LGBTQ folks fear is that covert discrimination. So at a vulnerable time in your life when you need palliative care or hospice care, uh, you're facing a serious illness, the idea of seeking out care from a provider that you don't really know if they'll be accepting or not can make you feel even more vulnerable. And that's based on um, people's lived experiences before they had a life-limiting illness or a serious illness, um, issues where either they weren't treated fairly, uh, they're asked questions by healthcare providers that make it clear that they don't see who they are. So, for example, if you walk into a clinic and the intake form says, you know, married, single, widowed, divorced, um, or let's say that there's only two boxes to check for gender, male, female, automatically people begin getting a picture of how inclusive that provider is. And so a lifetime of those small experiences with bigger experiences of, of overt discrimination can lead people to be fearful at the most vulnerable time of their life uh, to welcome someone into providing care. Discrimination um, at the end of life in terms of hospice and palliative care can look a lot of different ways. It could look like um, not treating a couple as a couple. Um, microaggressions, you know, constantly thinking that two women who are together are sisters as opposed uh, over and over and over again, so the default assumption. Um, and those things pile up. Yeah, I was struck too by some examples in your book of um, what struck me as um, cruel discrimination, uh, people at the very end of their life in hospice, um, um, having people, um, pr either the staff saying they'll pray for them, mm -hmm. or um, what really struck me was folks being denied adequate pain mm -hmm. management mm -hmm. uh, out of the idea that they should be punished somehow yeah. for their life. I, that, Absolutely. Yeah. I did a presentation in D.C. Um, about a year ago, and I was presenting to a group of, of nurses, and it was all nurses, and I always open up the, the talk by, by talking to people about their religious upbringing, I'm asking people, show of hands, how many of you grew up in a religious household uh, or part of a faith tradition? How many of you belong to a faith tradition that said homosexuality is a sin? And then I let people know, it's okay if you still believe that. What we're talking about here is your scope of practice as a nurse and really treating people with respect. And at the end of that talk, a woman came up to me and she said, I'm going to change my practice because of your presentation. And I said, how? And she said, I still think you're going to hell. But <laughs> I'm going to stop telling patients that. And I was speechless. And that does not happen often. <laughs> I was speechless. Um, and just thinking about if even one person, one patient had heard that from her. Mm -hmm. um, and imagine she had been, I don't think that's common. But the fact that there's anyone out there doing that is, is an issue. Um, our AARP, um, uh, the AARP did a survey uh, called Maintaining Dignity last year, and it had some really interesting data in it um, that said uh, three quarters of LGBTQ people worried that they won't have adequate family or social supports. Nearly three quarters don't have access to specific um, LGBT services. And at least 60% are concerned about neglect, about limited access to services, about verbal or physical harassment and abuse. Um, so those are some striking, uh, from a sample, a nationally re representative sample of AARP members, so interesting. Um, Kathy, who is an expert consultant, wrote the most recent guidelines for palliative care. I, 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 the question I've been wanting to ask you so much, and I think that audience members might want to know, is 
uh, the different, what does it feel like to be an expert in this field and to be experiencing it personally as well? <laughs> and I know that's a huge question. It's a big question. I, I think in your email you said, what is it like to be a patient? Um, and, and so I thought a lot about that. I, I, um, I, I go to bed early now and I wake up usually very early in the morning. And so this morning I was, of course, churning about what to, how to answer that question. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, certainly, I will tell you that the day we um, found out, which happened to be Kim's birthday, um, that I had ovarian cancer, um, I understood it. You know, it wasn't, it, I wasn't in denial that I had it um, because, you know, logically, I work in this field. So I understand people get illnesses and they die. Um, so cognitively, I got it. I think it took me a while to emotionally get it in the same way because there's this, there's like a cognitive shift that happens from being someone who is alive with a potential future to someone who is alive with an end date. And I have an expiration date. And so while well, I understood that intellectually, it took longer, I think. And it could be because I'm in the field, and the emo or it could be because uh, intellectually is easier to deal with than emotionally, maybe. Hello. Um, um, <laughs> my social worker wife is like, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Go with the second one. Um, is, you know, it, um, the, the, the thing that I think is different now, and my friends who are in the audience won't be surprised by this, is, and for me it, it was a big deal, is you, you're, you've lost control of things. Um, little things and big things. Um, uh, you know, little things like when we were at the NHPCO conference, Kim had to wheel me around. You know, I lost control. I'm not, I'm trying to direct her. She didn't like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so mostly I was just sitting there going, okay, where are we going? Um, but, but there are lots of experiences of that where it just hits you. Um, and so I think for professionals to think about what is it like when someone's newly diagnosed or, or finally comes to terms with their prognosis, you know, maybe they've been living with the illness for a long time, I think is to think about the fact that their role has changed, which I think most palliative care and hospice folks get that. You know, your your role is changing. You're not going to be the you know the person who uh, you know I used to be the grocery shopper and the cook and I don't do that anymore. I, you know, the roles change. I think people get that, but I think it's the combination of a cognitive shift from being someone who has potential beyond a certain date to someone who doesn't that I think can really mess with someone's mind on a daily and unexpected, like it just hits. Kim used to, um, you know, there have been times when Kim's walked in the door and I've started crying. She's like, what's going on? I said, I don't know. I was just, I missed you. And, you know, and I'm not a crier. <laughs> and, and I think it's part of that is it's just, it's a different experience. It really, I don't know how else to say it. I don't know if that answers your yeah, question. Yeah, it does. Um, do you think that there, is there a way that providers could, could be more aware of, uh, of that? Or is it something that you can't experience until it happens to you? I don't know that. You know, I'm not a clinician. So, I, you know, Kim, Kim and some of the other experts in the field uh, might have a, a better. You know, the, the one piece I say, and, and Kim's going to like this, is that I think we need more emphasis on the psychosocial aspects. I think we do a detriment to our patients and families when we don't invest in social workers. Um, I think that is a huge piece. I think, well, of course you have to have expert pain and symptom management. I think the piece, you know, not everyone's going to want a social worker, but I, I've got a community of people who understand these issues and can talk about them. A lot of people don't. And it's, it messes with your mind, you know? Like, it's, it's a real shift. Um, so I think that's the piece that I would say. Social workers, I got you, Judy. <laughs> OK, good. <laughs> that's we need great. to invest more in social workers. <laughs> that's wonderful. Um, uh, Ni Korderlai, welcome. Thank you. Party. Thank you for joining us. You. Glad you're here. Uh, we were talking a little bit about the Maintaining Dignity survey um, previously and about the um, 
maybe you can talk a little bit about it, about the, the findings, about um, what I thought was really remarkable that was that um, at least 60% of the folks who responded to the survey said they were concerned about uh, neglect, verbal or physical harassment and abuse. Was that a surprising finding to you or no? It was, it was surprising, and, and, and thank you for the warm invitation on behalf of AARP. You know, we're really proud of the Maintaining Dignity study. We refer to it as our landmark LGBT research study. Uh, and we first set out to better understand um, how AARP was perceived in LGBTQ communities. Uh, we wanted to understand that through a racial and ethnic lens, through a geographic lens, uh, through a gender and gender nonconforming lens. Um, and then we wanted to better understand how these issues uh, cut across our social impact uh, agenda. Uh, and so we set out and, and uh, we were able to uh, get a pretty significant national sample uh, to come out with some insights that were actionable. Um, yes, I was surprised that nearly two-thirds of the folks that we surveyed from across the country uh, were concerned about physical and verbal harassment, particularly in a long-term care setting. Uh, we saw that uh, about 76% of the folks that we surveyed were concerned about having adequate social and support networks, social support networks to rely on as they age. Um, and the one that really pulls at my heartstrings um, were the 34% of respondents that felt that they had to hide their identity mm -hmm. in order to obtain suitable mm -hmm. housing the basic right of housing. And so, um, you know, we are not all, you know, ARP's work can be measured by what we say and what we do. Uh, and we have put some stakes in the ground and we've made some early steps uh, to begin to address uh, these issues in a substantive way. And I look forward to sharing more about uh, how we're doing that. Great, thank you so much. And on the issue of housing, um, Joe, you are co-counsel on this case involving Mary Walsh and Bev Nance, um, who sued the St. Louis Area Assisted Living Center, uh, specific that this home de denied them space specifically because they were a same-sex couple, um, even after encouraging them in the first place. I wonder if you can uh, tell the audience the outcome so far of that case. And um, I wonder, the judge's decision in January hinged on uh, sex versus sexual orientation. And I wonder if you can um, describe that and, and tell us basically where we are with that case now. Sure, so uh, my firm represents uh, Mary Walsh and Bev Nance, a, a couple in St. Louis County, Missouri, uh, who have been together for 40 years, married uh, since 2009. Uh, and after uh, they retired, they began seeking long-term care uh, options to move out of their single family home uh, and they looked specifically for uh, a continuing care retirement community that where they could move into uh, independent living together uh, but then stay together for the rest of their lives regardless of the level of care that they needed. So they had friends uh, at Friendship Village Sunset Hills, a senior living community in uh, St. Louis County near their home. Uh, they knew people there, they visited on a number of occasions, uh, they were sort of courted by the, uh, the staff, uh, made a deposit, uh, and when a unit became available, uh, actually took steps to sell their home uh, and uh, almost put it on the market uh, before they were called by uh, a staff member at Friendship Village and asked what the nature of the re relationship was. Uh, Mary told uh, the, the person that they were a married couple, they'd been together for many years, uh, and they were you know, seeking to live together. The next day they got a call back saying, you're not welcome to live here. Uh, pursuant to our written policy, a copy of which was provided to them, uh, that limited uh, cohabitation uh, to married couples under the community's definition of marriage, which was the biblical definition of one man and one woman. This is not a religious community. It's not religiously affiliated in any way. Uh, it simply was a preference for uh, opposite sex couples uh, and a overt uh, discriminatory exclusion on same sex couples. So Mary and Bev were turned away. They were denied housing. Uh, we filed a lawsuit last summer under the Federal Fair Housing Act, which prohibits sex discrimination in housing. Uh, some federal courts, uh, have under both the Fair Housing Act and other uh, federal laws prohibiting sex discrimination found that 
uh, LGBT people are protected under existing federal sex discrimination laws. Um, there was actually a case in Illinois uh, that Lambda litigated uh, on behalf of Marsha Wetzel, a resident of a, an assisted living facility outside of Chicago who experienced pretty horrific harassment from other residents, um, homophobic epithets, physical assault. She won her case. Um, but uh, across the, the river in Missouri, uh, we had less luck. Um, and so we had a judge who uh, decided that sexual orientation discrimination is something different from sex discrimination and dismissed the case uh, in January. We're appealing that case to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. And we expect that because the Supreme Court took up the question uh, just a couple weeks ago in uh, several employment discrimination cases about how far the federal sex discrimination laws extend to uh, uh, LGB people, uh, that the case may uh, ultimately be resolved after the Supreme Court decides those cases. Uh, um, and so what's the status of Mary and Bev now? Uh, so uh, they are living in their home and still uh, seeking long-term uh, uh, living options. And I had understood that Mary had had some health problems. Um, and so the, so the very, um, you know, uh, all of our reporting about end of life care is d advanced care planning, um, put your, you know, get your ducks in a row basically for your end of life. And so that uh, obviously altered their end of life plan um, considerably. Uh, it certainly has made their, their life more challenging. You know, by this point, this all happened in 2016, so they would have been in uh, a home at uh, Friendship Village for the past three years with um, both a supportive uh, community, uh, you know, of, of friends and, and others, um, but also not having to worry about um, what their long-term health care uh, uh, needs were because they would be living in a community where they could have that um, taken care of. Uh, re and stay together uh, for the rest of their lives. And, and so not having that option is certainly making their, uh, their lives more difficult. Yeah. So the case is essentially on hold pending the Supreme Court action on these other cases, is that right? Uh, we, uh, we are waiting to uh, begin briefing in the Eighth Circuit. Um, the other side has sought to hold the case until after the Supreme Court rules, and we're waiting to find out if that's actually gonna happen. Okay. Um, a, a question related to that is, is in uh, long-term care or in um, hospice care, um, I wanted to ask Sean, so you're part of Seasons Hospice and Palliative Care, uh, which is one of the providers that has been certified by a program through SAGE called SAGE Care. Um, I, I'm told that there have been 50,000 providers at 300 U.S. sites certified across the U.S., um, but it's still not not the majority, you know, just a small proportion of the hospices that are out there. I wonder if you can tell us um, how it works and how it how it um, works with your staff and the and some of the um, what you can tell me about what they've learned and specific examples of how the such training might change the way they approach LGBTQ people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So I think Sage Care is wonderful just to make sure that our staff is culturally competent in their care providing for these LGBTQ older adults. Um, we want to make sure that our providers are open and willing to have the conversations with our patients and not being biased. A lot of times we have this implicit bias, which is a subconscious bias that we all have. And we're already projecting that onto our patient prior to us getting there. So it's important that we don't do that. And Sean, can, we, you, can you give an example of, uh, of an implicit bias and how that works in the real world? Yeah, of course. So I think like definitely if you walk into a patient's home and you see that the wife or you know, spouse has a wedding ring on and you say, you know, is, that's a beautiful ring, is that from your husband? You already closed off that communication to that LGBTQ patient because they're already thinking, oh, they're looking at that heteronormative person. Um, so it's very important that we don't do that and project our implicit bias on our patients like that. What's the question they should ask instead? So I think they should say, tell me about your loved one. I think that's very important. So mm -hmm. keep that open communication. Or tell me about the important people in your life. That's important too. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, and I wonder if you can talk about some of the um, responses that your staff has had af after training. 
Yeah, so I think that a lot of people are very open, but some of them are still very closed-minded. Um, so I think that most of the time, you know, the training goes well, but people have questions. So we always want to answer our staff's questions. So it's always about how do you approach a situation and making sure that they're providing a safe place for our LGBTQ patients. So making sure that our staff understand that, for example, patients may not want to go to a higher level of care or like a long-term care facility, and they're not understanding why that is well that's because they may not feel that the facility would be safe or would engage an LGBTQ patient so it's important that we understand that you know somebody who was born in the 1930s has had a different perspective and a different journey than somebody who's been in you know our era now so it's important to understand you know that trauma that they've experienced in the past may affect them transitioning into long-term care mm -hmm. so I think like diving in deeper with the staff to understand those like minimal and key points that they may not get from the training. Mm -hmm. um, so just understanding that not everybody is gonna have that perfect end of life experience or wanna change to a higher level of care until we can provide them with like a SAGE certified provider mm -hmm. that makes them feel safe. So what do you say to a staff member who um, says, I, I don't need this training, I treat everybody the same? Yeah, so I think that people need to understand that, yes, you not everybody is treated the same, especially different communities. Like, we learn how to take care of Jewish patients. We learn how to take care of African-American patients. So, you know, we all get that training through hospice care. So this is another community that we need to be focused in and understand the training about. So I'm very much so open about having a dialogue and a conversation with them, you know, that this is, you know, we need to understand more about our population. So this is important that we take these steps to learn. And I wonder if you can talk about the impact on, on patients then. I, I wonder if you've seen impact uh, before and after training and what, what patients who receive this care tell you. So um, recently we actually had a case where um, we had a patient come on service and they were um, very difficult with the admission nurse and um, also our intake department, um, but we actually placed a male nurse and it was a um, male and male couple. Um, so we put the male nurse into the home and they were actually very receptive to him um, because he said the admission nurse actually had said to him like, oh, is this your friend? So mm -hmm. they diminished that relationship from the start, mm -hmm. and that's very important that we never diminish those relationships. We don't refer to them as friends. We ask them, what can I call your significant other? Do you like them to re be referred as your husband, your spouse, mm -hmm. um, you know, your partner, your lifelong partner? So it's important that we don't create that barrier right away. Mm -hmm. So the question that he asked was, how can I refer to your significant other instead? And I, that changed the whole dynamic. Mm -hmm. I can see that. That makes sense. Good. Very interesting. Thank you. Erin, um, we had referred previously to some of the federal policies, um, uh, policy actions regarding LGBTQ people. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about some of those. I mean, uh, last Friday, the House passed the Equality Act in the House, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I wonder if you can talk about the, the policy landscape now that folks are facing. Sure. I think the biggest thing on our radar right now is the reauthorization of the Older Americans Act. And how many folks in the room are familiar with the OAA? Yeah. So, at least a good half of you. Uh, so I'll give you the, the short version yes. of what that is. Um, the Older Americans Act is the primary vehicle for the organization and delivery of social and nutrition programs in our country. It came about in 1965 under Lyndon Johnson's Great Society as a counterpart to Medicare and Social Security. The idea being you have Social Security there ideally for your financial needs and Medicare there for your medical needs. And the Older Americans Act is everything else that enables you to age in place in your community. So it funds chore assistance, transportation assistance, legal assistance, um, all sorts of programs that allow people to age in place. Probably the most famous program funded under the Older Americans Act is Meals on Wheels, which is a great example of what the Older Americans Act does. Uh, it also funds senior centers and congregate meals, so meals in places like senior centers. And there are certain populations in the statute uh, defined by cultural and social isolation as well as poverty. And these are so-called greatest social needs populations. So these are populations that Congress believes need a little bit more attention from what's termed the aging network, all those aging providers across the country. And um, the reason is, in part, to address you know, the question we were just talking about, you know, can we simply treat everyone the same? Is that sufficient? 
And we're, our, our main legislative goal right now at SAGE is to designate both LGBT older people as well as older people living with HIV as these greatest social needs populations. And that's because when we look at this popula population, we see, or both of these populations, we see higher rates of poverty, higher rates of social isolation, disconnection from families of origin. And because of that, uh, they're more in need of the programs uh, and services funded by the Older Americans Act. But because of discrimination and fear of discrimination, they're, they're less likely to access them. So by designating LGBT folks, and as well as those living with HIV as a greatest social need population, it can, kind of tells the aging network that you have to do a little bit more to reach this population. You can't simply, quote unquote, treat everybody the same. Makes sense. Um, there's some concern about the rollback, of, potential rollback of Section 1557 of the ACA. Um, are, is, are we expecting action on that anytime soon? Soon? What are folks Joe, thinking? Joe might know more about this. Yeah. I kind of feel like it, every few months we hear a little blip that it's going to be coming down the pike very soon. Right. Um, you know, most recently uh, we thought it might happen at the National Prayer Breakfast. It's kind of hard to tell when this is going to happen. Yeah. Um, but there is an ongoing court case where I know this is coming up. Um, and uh, that's where the administration has publicly said that is their intention to roll back uh, the protections under 1557. You know more details about that case, Joe? Uh, a, a little bit. So uh -huh. uh, Section 1557 is the ACA's non-discrimination provision, so it prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex, uh, race, and uh, age, and other protected uh, classifications in federally funded health programs. So that's um, most uh, insurance companies, uh, public uh, uh, insurance programs like Medicaid, uh, many uh, large health providers that receive federal funding. Um, there is the statute that prohibits discrimination and then also the regulations uh, that uh, the Department of Health and Human Services promulgated in 2016 to specifically define sex discrimination to include gender identity discrimination. Um, the, a, a court put a hold on that uh, at, in the end of uh, 2016, uh, a conservative court in the Northern District of Texas. Fortunately, other courts, including in a case that I'm litigating against the Wisconsin Medicaid program, which has a blanket exclusion on transition-related health care, um, have held that the statute itself can be interpreted to protect, uh, in our case, transgender people from discrimination uh, under 1557, regardless of what the HHS regulation, what their interpretation mm -hmm. is. So. Uh, the administration may very well try to roll back um, these protections through a regulation, uh, but ultimately it will be up to the courts uh, to determine uh, the scope of the, the statutory protections. And hopefully cases like ours will um, uh, uh, help in that effort. And what about the impact of the um, HHS conscience rule that we heard so much about a couple weeks ago? Um, that it's the rule that is des designed to protect the religious rights of health providers and re religious institutions. Um, the administration says it affirms existing conscience protections established by Congress. Um, but I heard from many LGBTQ mm -hmm. advocates who thought that it would be a, a way to foster more discrimination. What do you think, Kim? I think it's Let's monstrous. Um, if someone is a health care provider, health care providers have an obligation to provide high quality care to each person, regardless of their judgment of a person's morality, ethics, religion, politics. And if health care professionals are going to be in a position to decide the worthiness of someone to receive care, we're headed down a very, very, very slippery slope as a country. Um, in, the, in this climate, I'd like to talk a little bit now about um, how folks can uh, ensure that they're not discriminated against. And um, uh, Nick Cordelai, maybe you can help with talking about um, some of the findings in the AARP study, um, survey about the fears. And, and you said you had some thoughts about what to do about them. Yeah. Um, you know, I think part of what we're hearing right now is that a rising tide does not lift all boats. Mm -hmm. Surprise, surprise. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that insight was pretty clear in our Maintaining Dignity study, particularly among black and Latino LGBTQ respondents. Um, we saw evidence uh, of fear around compound discrimination. Can you describe what that is a little bit? Feeling uh, actual or perceived discrimination based upon one's uh, race and ethnicity in addition to one's sexual orientation and gender identity. 
um, we saw elevated levels, particularly among black and Latino respondents, compared to uh, white respondents. And so um, I think you know, that emphasizes the need for uh, programs like Sage Care uh, to uh, offer cultural competency uh, training to raise the proficiency of healthcare professionals across the country. Um, you know, it, our ARP California State Office was a part of a coalition uh, that passed the LGBTQ Senior Bill of Rights in California. Uh, our Massachusetts State Office was a part of a coalition uh, that uh, passed a law that uh, uh, required that healthcare workers uh, have some level of cultural competency training uh, for the LGBTQ community. Uh, and so these are just a few examples of what we've done on the policy side of the house. Um, I think Sage Care is a great program. I think the LGBT Prepare to Care Guide, it's a caregiving guide uh, that AARP developed in partnership with Sage. Um, at, at one point after we released it, we had trouble keeping it on the shelves. Mm -hmm. Not just because it was that popular, there's some great pictures in that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but because there was so much demand, so much demand. And so, you know, as we sit here today and as we, you know, think about uh, these challenges, you know, let's also um, think about how we can solve for it programmatically, how we can solve for it on the policy side of the house, um, how we can solve for it as individual change, change agents. Uh, that's, that's work that um, goes beyond any administration uh, it is work that we've all got to be um, all in for, uh, for the foreseeable future. And so, and, and so doing this work uh, through an equity lens, with an attentiveness mm -hmm. to the folks that are pushed most on the margins, uh, is um, going to be a challenge. Uh, but I think it's a challenge that we're all up for. Thank you so much. Um, so, Kim and Kathy, I've already talked with you in such a personal way, um, but I wanted to ask you a little more. Um, when we spoke, you had said that, that the care that you received was entirely appropriate during Kathy's surgery. Um, you were able to uh, recover. You were able to push the beds together, watch movies. No one said she was your sister, and it sounded entirely appropriate and, and wonderful. Um, the same time, um, you guys had told me about a friend of yours um, in Texas um, whose partner had a massive heart attack, mm -hmm. and he wound up in a hospital in the ICU, um, a very dangerous situation, and, and the ICU is set up like a fishbowl, kind of, and he's in there with his partner, you know, as one would, holding hands, kissing his forehead, and he looks out of the ICU bay, and he sees the nurses um, giggling and laughing and pointing. And uh, he said it to me. He said it felt like a homophobic response. And just when you're so concerned about your partner surviving, um, and when his partner needed pain medicine, he was given, uh, he was told he could have Tylenol 3 and nothing stronger, um, which wasn't adequate for the pain. And, and you had a couple stories like that in your book as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so, what I wanted to ask was for people who are thinking about this and thinking about coming up against these, these issues in their own life, mm -hmm. um, w what if people speak up and it, and it impacts their care? What if you speak up and the nurse who's pointing and laughing, uh, what if you're for, what if you, how do you, how do you do that, I guess, is the better question. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I, so I think putting the onus on LGBTQ people to be the ones speaking yeah. up isn't fair. I think if anyone is witnessing that happening, someone else should be speaking up. If anyone witnesses that, you should speak up, not the person who is in the right, vulnerable position. Um, yeah. And you know, it isn't even just the speaking up that could impact the care, it's the remaining silent and because you're afraid, you mm -hmm. know, you, you don't wanna say anything because it could make it worse. And so, so someone needs to speak up, it should not be the person who is the victim of that, it should be anyone else mm -hmm. who's standing by. And I would take it a step further and say, if you're standing by and seeing that happen, you're doing it to that person as well. You're if, as responsible. You're silent, absolutely, you're absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, hearing that makes me think of a, a really good friend of mine um, uh, who was in a head-on collision. You know, gay, openly gay <coughs> friend of mine in a head-on collision in Los Angeles. Uh, and I'm thinking about the care that uh, that he received. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, uh, he is. Um, 
100% um, authentically himself all the time. <laughs> uh, and, you know, he has nail polish on his toenails. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he is in excruciating pain. Uh, he's in the hospital bed. Uh, and, um, you know, he was cognizant and communicative. Uh, and uh, he noticed that there was a nurse that came in to check on him. Uh, and she was sort of changing his bedding and pulled up the bedding and saw that he had nail polish on. And, you know, he described it as sort of a shift in energy that he felt. Mm. And he noticed that after she saw the toenail polish, that she seemed a little rougher with him, you know, in, in you know, changing his IV and, and um, all of the things that needed to do to move him around. She was just more rough with him. Mm. And he had the wherewithal to think, you know, I think she knows I'm gay and she's responding to that negatively. Mm -hmm. And so he asked the supervising nurse if they could, uh, to ch if they could change his attending nurse, mm -hmm. you know, but not everybody uh, has the courage mm -hmm. to be able to do that. Uh, and that's a part of the challenge. That's what the challenge mm -hmm. looks like. And so I agree with you a thousand percent that you know, as patient advocates, as friends, as mm -hmm. family members, these are things that we absolutely have to look out for. Right. And uh, similar issues um, when seeking long-term care, of course the issue with that is often you don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm wondering about um, some of the advice that I was told by sources was to um, at least have a c candid conversation and a ask the folks um, when you are interviewing to go into long-term care, um, uh, you know, what's your experience treating LGBTQ people? And if they say we've never had any, don't believe them. <laughs> um, so that seemed like a good point uh, to make for the wider community. Um, so, I, so I'd like to open this up now because I'm sure you all have questions uh, for our panel and questions about the issues in general um, and, and maybe some experiences too, some, some um, times when you've uh, been able to, to do it in a way that worked for the patients and for the caregivers and we'd like to hear about that. So yes, way in the back first. Yes. Hello, Eric Scharf with the uh, Depression Bipolar Support Alliance. Um, I think, Aaron, you made a uh, brief reference to the issue of social isolation. Uh, we are doing a lot of work these days on social isolation and loneliness. I um, was uh, hoping you could um, uh, comment about how to deal with those issues uh, in this uh, uh, setting. Uh, we're actually working with a new national coalition on uh, social isolation and loneliness that uh, uh, we'll be hearing more about in, in, in the coming weeks. But uh, like I said, if you, if you could kind of touch on that issue, I'd like to hear more about it. Thank you. I wasn't sure who that was addressed to. Oh, so. I, 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 think think I think he said me. Oh, but he, I wasn't, but okay. Discuss amongst yourselves. Who, okay. oh, who, has, uh, who has thoughts I, about addressing <laughs> the issue of isolation, which I am sure is a, is a key issue in yeah. this community? I mean, I, I think I can give you one example of a program that we have at SAGE up at our headquarters in New York, and this is our Friendly Visitors Program. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a surprisingly large number of LGBT older folks, um, in addition to the general population. And I think I should just make a note for one second of saying that many of the challenges that LGBT older folks face, like social isolation and poverty and whatnot, are the sim similar issues to similar challenges that other older adults face. So this is not a unique problem to LGBT folks. But unfortunately, it's more pronounced in the LGBT community. Mm -hmm. And there are other challenges as well in terms of going into the closet and so on and so forth. Right. So with respect to social isolation, one program we have in New York is this Friendly Visitors Program. People sign up, and there is some um, level of commitment. So it's not this one-off where someone just visits someone you know, once, uh, and that's it. Uh, but there's some level of commi commitment, whether it's six months or at least a year. And I remember hearing the story of one of these people who is homebound, and he had not left his apartment in four years. And you know, personally, I cannot even imagine not leaving my apartment you know, for a whole day, but I can't imagine, <laughs> let alone you know, four years. Um, and for many of these people, much like with the Meals on Meals program, it's so meaningful to have someone just even come into their home and have some level of social interaction with them uh, that it, it does really make a world of difference. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, not everyone has access to a friendly visitor program or a similar program like that. Mm -hmm. I could tell you about another innovative program through our affiliate in Maine 
uh, which is a much more rural setting than New York City. And people there, you know, it might be harder to get up and running a, a friendly visitors program. So what they do is they have a, a call-in uh, line once a week at an appointed time. And people can even call in anonymously if they're still a little bit in the closet and afraid to be out. And it gives, gives them just a little bit of a chance for some sort of social interaction. Um, and again, something as small as that can make a, a world of difference. Mm -hmm. uh, on the um, litigation, uh, did any of the residents of Friendship Village speak up in opposition to or in favor of um, uh, Mary Walsh and Bev Nance? Or were uh, they silent on that? I think there was. Uh, I, I don't know the, the specifics, but I do know that there were residents of Friendship Village after the lawsuit was filed who um, were unhappy uh, with the, the policy and that this had happened. Um, and uh, you know, I, I suspect that it would have been a more welcoming community uh, among the residents had they been able to live there than the administration uh, was. The other I think it's an option on the table, and uh, we, you know, we'll see how long the, the litigation plays out and what their situation is. Then it'll be very different by the end of this lawsuit than it was in 2016 when they were, you know, just at the beginning of their uh, long-term housing search. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Um, you know, it's certainly a concern that a, a community has, uh, at least from the uh, the official level, communicated to them that they're not welcome, um, and that's something that they will, you know, have to weigh. Yeah, and I know this is the one that you litigated, um, but I wondered what um, m maybe have, if you have informally heard from folks in similar situations um, uh, who have been turned away. Um, I mean, maybe this is the case that could go to court, but. Uh, in the senior setting, uh, you know, I'm aware of the the Wetzel case, yes. um, and there was another case involving a couple that uh, were not seniors, a, a married same-sex couple with children in Colorado, uh, who were turned away from rental housing uh, because the landlord thought their situation was too unique, and uh, the landlord wanted to keep a low profile in her uh, Boulder County community. Uh, they sued under the Fair Housing Act uh, and also won their case uh, about two years ago. So there is a split, at least, in how the courts are interpreting the federal protections. I should say, uh, and this is a call, I, I think that in addition to sort of federal policy answers like the Equality Act, which would you know, establish firmly that these protections uh, exist under federal law, that there are obviously a number of state and local uh, jurisdictions that also have non-discrimination protections that expressly prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, and that there is a need for more of those. Missouri did not have a statewide law prohibiting sex, sexual orientation discrimination in housing. Uh, although the state Supreme Court recently uh, issued a decision in a Title VII an employment discrimination case holding that uh, under state law, sex discrimination protections might extend to LGBT uh, plaintiffs. Um, but that said, uh, even St. Louis County, where uh, Friendship Village is located, has a local non-discrimination ordinance that prohibits sexual orientation discrimination. And Friendship Village was aware of that. And HUD actually did an investigation of this complaint before we filed a lawsuit. Uh, and it was revealed that they just took the risk because the protections weren't robust enough that mm. they they just, despite having knowledge of the local protections, um, you know, calculated that they would prefer to keep this discriminatory policy on the books rather than comply even with local law. So we have to be vigilant, mm -hmm. uh, and this is an overt form of discrimination. There's lots of studies from housing discrimination testing uh, of same-sex couples mm -hmm. and LGBT housing seekers that there's all sorts of uh, subtle discrimination that housing seekers face, whether they're seniors or otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, really high rates of discrimination faced by same-sex couples, um, including being treated differently by rental agents, quoted higher prices, uh, you know, being told a unit's not available when it is, or being shown less desirable units, being steered away to other communities where you might be uh, happier. Um, and those are things that are harder to uh, know that you yourself are going through if you're seeking housing. And so working with 
Um, you know, especially in the housing context with local fair housing centers, if you're, you know, suspect discrimination or think that there might be, uh, that, that testing is, is a way to uncover some of the more um, covert, uh, subtle discrimination that I think is, you know, just as harmful uh, or, or worse than some of the, the, the rarer examples of the overt discrimination mm -hmm. like Mary and Bev face. And, and to your point around some of the covert and overt mm -hmm. forms of, of uh, discrimination, particularly related to housing, um, at AARP, we actually filed an amicus brief in support of the Marshall Wetzel case, which was, um, you know, a very big step for us as an organization and absolutely the right thing to do uh, as a partner to Lambda Legal. Uh, uh, and on the covert side, uh, we've actually uh, started doing some work with an organization called NAGLREP, the National Association of Gay and Lesbian Real Estate Professionals. Uh, and we work, yeah, can you believe that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I said the same thing. Uh, and we work with Nagel Rep and Sage uh, to do something pretty extraordinary. Um, real estate agents uh, have to obtain what's called the Senior Real Estate Specialist Credential. Uh, if they, you know, want this, want to be an, be an expert in serving the 50 plus, you need this SRES credential. Uh, and so Nagel Rep went to the National Association of Realtors and said, hey, as we look at your curriculum, we don't see any LGBT content. How can we support you in uh, creating some content that's more um, LGBT friendly, that helps to strengthen the cultural proficiency, mm -hmm. cultural competency of real estate professionals across the country? Well, National Association of Realtors said, sure, you know, can you develop it and send it to us? And so Nagorep called AARP, they called SAGE, it said, hey, let's put our heads together. Let's pull from the Maintaining Dignity research, let's pull from some of the research that SAGE had done, um, and let's create something, some, create some content. Um, and we did, and we submitted it, and now that's a part of the certification. You know, there's a section, it's a part of the, the certification, where real estate professionals across the country seeking this designation um, have to have um, some immersion uh, in uh, this LGBT content in order to be certified. Um, the year before we took this up, about 17,000 real estate professionals across the country downloaded this curriculum in order to get this credential. And so it's, an, it's a very creative example of how we need to fight the good fight on the policy side of the house, on the program side of the house. You know, we need to uh, make sure that in terms of cultural competency training, you know, we're tapping into networks like Sage Care uh, to have trainers go out uh, to uh, train healthcare professionals, and we've got to create content uh, that helps to educate folks uh, every step of the way. That's great. Um, another question? Yes. Hi. Hi. Good morning, uh, Deidre Gray, DC Health. Um, I self-disclose that I'm a trans woman of color. And so as you were talking earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, about some of the um, erasures and eliminations of trans people in the data, um, I kind of have two questions, two part question. First part, um, as a 40 something trans person who is um, looking ahead to see uh, what my retirement um, post six, um, 65 years of age and how that's going to look, and as well as the youngest child who happens to be the power of attorney mm -hmm. of my uh, remaining parent who lives in Nebraska, a red state, mm -hmm. where there is not a recognition of gender identity um, that is not in, as you said earlier, the biblical um, mm -hmm. explanation. Do you have any data that you're able to reference or that you're looking to gather um, to support um, trans people as we're aging and how we're accessing um, housing and health care how we're going into the courts to advocate for our loved ones um, and that type of discrimination that's faced in that space. Do you have any data that can reflect that? Or are you looking to engage with any data that can reflect that? Thank you. Well, we are, at AARP, we're definitely looking um, to collect more data. In fact, uh, with the Maintaining Dignity Study, we found there are four areas where AARP can make the biggest difference. Addressing issues related to culturally competent care, affordable housing, social isolation, and data collection. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we very much are invested in continuing to, to uh, conduct and publicly release research uh, that helps to fill some of the gaps. 
you know, when we did this, this study, at first we were looking at 50 plus LGBTQ folks. Uh, and what we found is that that research sample um, was mostly white, it was mostly white. Uh, and so, you know, for all the folks that want to geek out with me in terms of research design, um, you know, we, we played with different scenarios. And where we landed was we dropped the, the, the age of our, of our sample to 45 plus. And that allowed us to have about a third of our respondents uh, from communities of color. Uh, it allowed for us to have uh, a bigger sample of folks that identified as gender nonconforming, which is uh, inclusive of but not limited to transgender. Uh, and so, um, you know, this was a stake in the ground. It's an opportunity for us to do better. I want to learn more about your experience uh, going back to Nebraska uh, as, as a, a trans woman of color um, and some of the unique challenges that you're having to navigate so that uh, for the next study that we're working on, we can make sure that we're collecting insights that meet you where you're at. Let's see, way in the back there. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, is it on? Okay. Um, my name is Andy. I worked with Kimberly on the book, uh, doing press. And the reason I came to Kimberly and working with the book, um, I work with a scholarly publisher, and this book came up. But uh, my mother died a couple years ago, and one of the nurses caring for her made an aside to me that was very subtle, but she said something about me being gay, and it had never come up at all um, during my mother's treatment and when she was in hospice. I didn't take great exception, but I just thought, hmm, that didn't seem, seem right. And then after that, um, I took Kimberly's book and sent it to Hospice of Dayton, which is the largest, I believe, hospice in the US and the oldest, mm -hmm. which is the hospice that took care of my mother. And I believe now they're adopting the book into their program and they're waiting to get SAGE certified. And, um, but anyway, that whole thing happened just because of an incident at my mother's hospice. And my point is, it's not just LGBTQ patients. It can be a straight mm -hmm. patient yeah. mm -hmm. and their LGBTQ son or daughter, you know, whoever, that could also be experiencing some um, discrimination, mm -hmm. even if it's subtle. So that was just my point there. That's a good it's, point. It's just Hi, Andy, just too. Hi. <laughs> All right. Here, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, Kim, this is, hi. Hey. Oh, okay. Hi. Uh, my name's Gray Handley. Um, that was wonderful. But, you know, I'm sure this room is filled with healthcare providers like you. Uh, and the decision that Kathy's made not to pursue any treatment whatsoever kind of touches us, right, in our workplace, in our philosophy and our whole orientation toward our careers and our lives. Can you talk a little bit about how, you know, you as a loving couple came to, you, you as a health professional in a loving couple could accept that? Because I'm putting myself in your shoes, I would like, I would have a very hard time if my spouse said to me, I'm not going to do anything, you know? And, and how did you how did you all together come to an understanding that that was okay with the fact that that's your job right. is to is to provide those interventions and there you know there are interventions mm -hmm. that could have been tried that's a great question so um ironically so when i was in graduate school my mom was diagnosed with ovarian cancer uh, when she was 48 and she had chemotherapy uh, pretty much nonstop for four years. She was diagnosed, had stage four ovarian cancer at diagnosis, um, and had chemo for four years. And um, had a horrible quality of life, despite my dad's best efforts to really give her the kind of care that she wanted. Um, and so I have my own personal list of diseases that if I ever get, I'm, I want aggressive palliative care <laughs> and ovarian cancer, you know, stage three or four was on that list. Um, so for me, it was actually very easy, um, the decision with Kathy. Um, I think the important point is that she's not doing nothing. She's doing aggressive palliative care. And so, 
So the decision was between when people talk about choosing curative or palliative for, for situations like this, there is no curative. There is literally nothing that can be done for what she has that will make her not die. Nothing. And so the when... The disease will kill me. Right. The disease is going to kill her and uh, it might give her, you know, if her kind of cancer were receptive to chemo, which it's not, she has clear cell ovarian cancer, um, might give her a couple months of having chemo, but that's, that's not extra time, that's time that she just gave to the medical community, right. but it, it's not right. time she got. Right. So she's doing aggressive palliative care. So I had no problem with it at all, right. neither did our son. Right. We never had a moment where we're, as a family, we were like, please try everything. No, we're trying everything palliative. Um, you know, I think part of it is we knew a little bit more than the average person, obviously, um, <laughs> from Kim's experience, but also from working mm -hmm. in this space. Um, and from working at a hospice. We both worked at, at a hospice in Florida and working at the national organization. I've heard a lot of patient family stories, both from personal folks, but also professionally. And what what I knew, and this was before we knew it was clear cell, I mean, there was, there, my oncologist really was hoping I would do some chemo or some Avastin. And um, what was important to me and what Kim and I talked about is once I intellectually got what stage three ovarian, because she knew that better than I did because of her mom, but once I got that, um, it became clear to me that the choice was more time with healthcare professionals, which I love y'all, but um, <laughs> no. But I, but I don't like, I don't like healthcare professionals. I have had discriminatory practices against me. I don't like being in the hospital. I hate all of that. So for me, the quality of life issue, there was no question because it wouldn't be a long period of time and it wouldn't be, there would be no time between treatment where I would have a good, better quality of life that I have right now. My quality of life right now is great. I'm, we're moving, I mean, we're busy, we got all this stuff, but we're having fun. You know, we we're doing things as a couple. We're spending time as a family. I'm seeing friends and family. Um, I had a mentor, uh, Mary Labiak, who worked at, uh, was the leader of Suncoast Hospice, and she had lung cancer. And to watch her, and there are people in this room who saw the transformation of her physical commanding presence shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, not being able to work, not being able to do what her passion was, which was end of life care. Mm -hmm. um, and she made a speech at the NHPCO conference when we gave her an award saying basically they have to pretty much kill you to cure you. Problem is they didn't cure her, she still died. Mm -hmm. you know, and so hearing those stories, living those stories, I think the more we can talk about and promote, and that's why Kim and I are doing our updates online. You know, Grant and I went to a movie yesterday, or Sunday. If you haven't read the update yet, the seats actually rock, and I'm getting punched <laughs> in the back, and I'm in pain. And, I mean, it was funny. Um, but we're making memories, and we're having fun, and we're spending time yeah. together. And that's what matters to me. And that's, that's how we made the choice. Right. We prioritize that. Yeah, and I think the other piece that has made a big difference for her quality of life, and, and Kathy's smiling. She's like, oh God, don't say it. Um, medical marijuana has ended up being playing a massive role in this. Okay. Massive. And so when we talk about the opioid crisis and when we talk about all of these issues around narcotics and, you know, the controversies around opioids, well, for Kathy and the kind of cancer she has, a bowel obstruction we do not want. And so it's all about keeping the bowels moving. So we're avoiding opioids um, and we are going toward the medical marijuana. And that is the primary, that and um, dexamethasone steroids, are the, those are the two medicines that she is on. Um, and it is life changing. It's not <laughs> life saving. Of it, only one of which is paid for by only healthcare. One of, and so I want to I want to <laughs> say that medical marijuana for the amount that I mean she's three months post diagnosis. They have said three she'll to, probably die months. by August. So she's doing pretty well. It's a lot of weed going on. Here, <laughs> okay? And so when we talk about advocacy, um, it costs several thousand dollars a month for the medical marijuana to keep her functioning, feeling like this. So as we think about ways to make life better for all patients near the end of life, right. I think we need to be open to different paths. Um, and I, I'm happy. 
<laughs> Sorry. It's a good test. Sorry. Um, but, but I think it's important. Mm -hmm. and, and again, I think part of why we have been comfortable talking about it publicly is we've been, I've always been, we've both always been out. I've always been way outer. More out. I've been way out. Like, I'm a little bit more bleh, than Kathy. Kathy's a little more private. But I think we've been more comfortable being public about the medical marijuana because people already know we're lesbians. Like, how much more can they judge me? So, <laughs> <laughs> <it's just fine. laughs> and I'm not going to be here. So. <laughs> Sorry for the digression Sorry. there. There's another question here. Hi, Meg Foley. I'm in the practice room. A lot of experience with um, HIV and uh, and oncology care. And so my questions are really mostly for Kim, although I've heard echoes a lot with um, with what others have said. So in terms of nursing curricula, mm -hmm. are you seeing a big boost in thirst for this knowledge? Um, are you seeing the population of students changing in attitudes? Mm -hmm. And are you seeing any board questions for nursing boards? Yeah. That so that's such a great issues? question. So um, we are seeing a population change in students. So um, you know, more and more seeing students who are choosing programs. Uh, this is the last three or four years are the first years that I'm really seeing students coming, saying, "I looked for a program that had out faculty. I looked through the bios to see does anyone mention LGBTQ work." Um, Am I seeing a big boost in curricula? No. And I would say that that is related to your third question, which is board questions. So mm. until um, USMLE for, medical, for physicians and NCLEX for nursing, until there is a push to ensure that there's not just a few questions, but infusion around LGBTQ inclusive right. care, the curricula will not change. And so, um, no, I'm not seeing a big infusion uh, because if it's not being tested, it's not really being valued. Now, there are some schools that are really making that push, and UVA is one of those schools that's really uh, looking to infuse that throughout. And so it's part of the reason why I'm moving toward UVA. Um, and so it is happening, but it is, I think, the board questions really are going to help drive that change. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sorry, I guess I'm not supposed to pick people. Okay. <laughs> no, go ahead. Well, she, thank you for picking yes. me. <laughs> Hi, I'm Judy Paris with Social Work Hospice and Palliative Care Network. Um, congratulations, Kathy, on the latest edition of the consensus guidelines. And although they probably don't specifically mention medical marijuana, I'm wondering what your hope is for them in the future. <laughs> for the guidelines? <laughs> Hopefully, no one. Hopefully, none of the <coughs> guidelines chairs are watching. Um, so, what I will say is, I think that medical marijuana is part of a palliative care plan and should be part of a palliative care plan. Um, I think that, um, as Kim mentioned, opioids are not my friend. Um, not only because of the bowel obstruction, but because I, don't, I just don't handle opioids well. <laughs> um, but I, I do think that. Um, there is a role, there are patients who are taking it now, who uh, healthcare professionals, because of federal laws, aren't able to give advice on how to do it. So when Kim, Kim went to the dispensary here in DC several times before I did, um, and basically the only people who are advising you on, oh, you have pain. I mean, they ask him. You, she has pain. She has nausea. Those are the things we Not want me, to manage. You, right? Yeah, yeah anxiety. <laughs> um, and so they asked the question, and they gave advice. But they're people who work at a dispensary. They're not medical professionals. So it needs to be integrated. So I do think there is a, uh, a challenge and an opportunity for hospice and palliative care professionals to learn about it, because your patients are going mm -hmm. to use it. Um, it's it's uh, how many states now? I don't know. Well, you're the one who brought it up. Um, <laughs> you know, there are I never states. Works for you. I have no idea about there the are law. Never states. But you know, our nurse practitioner, she um, is interested and wants to hear what we're doing, but she can't give me advice. She's never even been to a dispensary. She wants to go. You know, and so I would advise palliative care professionals reach out to local dispensaries, talk to them, do outreach around palliative care. There, mm -hmm. there's a ton of people there. Kim, Kim's been making this point all over the place. There's a ton of people there who need palliative care. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, 
mm, I would say, I hope, most of the people taking medical marijuana actually have a medical problem that is addressed mm -hmm. by the marijuana. And it really does help. So mm -hmm. I think there's a, a role for a partnership and an integration. And Kim probably has better ideas. Well, and but the need for more research. I mean, I think yeah. we need to understand more about the effect, you know, if you're trying to treat nausea versus sleep versus we've had to experiment. Like I, they have a strain of marijuana and they tell me, oh, it's good for this. So I bring it home and we try it out like Girl Scout cookies versus like, I don't know these things. And so we kind of trial and error, yeah. um, but it would be really helpful for folks to do research and actually be able to say, you know, understanding this about the cannabinoid system and how does it impact right. this? You know? Even breaking down the fears or making people aware that it's an option. Right. Because I don't believe right now that healthcare professionals can do that. Right. But it, re it is a viable option right. for folks depending on the diagnosis right. and the situation. And the federal laws, I do want to add this, even though it is legal in D.C., it is still illegal. It is considered um, Schedule One federally. And so that actually limits quality of life for people who are at the end of life. So when we, um, I can say this now because we're back from, right. but when we were going to see our son win, um, a film award in Oklahoma, our biggest concern was how are we actually going to manage her symptoms in Oklahoma? That meant flying on an airplane with marijuana. And so we had we to did. have, and we did. Um, we had conversations with my family. My dad was like, I'll bail you out if you guys get stuck. <laughs> um, I had know. to carry it all. I, I was like, I'm not if they're going to arrest someone, you arrest the terminally ill woman. Right. And so, um, but we had to, I mean, we're law abiding. <laughs> we're law abiding people. And so we, but, a, but if we weren't risk takers, we wouldn't have gone to Oklahoma. We would not have seen our son win an award in an international film festival. Um, and so when we talk about laws like uh, around cannabis, it impacts LGBTQ patients at the end of life. It impacts everybody. Yeah. Um, Sorry to derail it and talk about weed. <laughs> Sorry. Um, let's see. I'm seeing you were next. Okay. Thank you. And then you. Good, good morning. My name is Aaron Tripp from Leading Age. Mm -hmm. um, we've got uh, in November, there's a, a new part of the nursing home regulations that's adding trauma-informed care. And that's a mm. big, big concern and big yep. thing that a lot of facilities are pushing. And um, you mentioned trauma before. I'm curious if you guys could talk about sort of the intersection between cultural competency mm -hmm. and trauma-informed care, particularly sure. for long-term care and end of life for the population. I can give you an example yeah. of uh, a client I have in my old job when I worked on Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and he was my oldest client. He had been kicked out of the military during World War II, and mm -hmm. in the process of being kicked out was thrown in the Navy brig in the prison for a few weeks underwent a psychological examination where they tried to you know, really figure out if he was gay and they ultimately determined that he liked interior decor decorating. That was a piece of it, which was true because he became an interior decorator and um, on his discharge paperwork, it said on it, class two homosexual and undesirable. That was his official characterization from the government. And we were helping him out you know, towards, you know, more towards his end of life, uh, trying to make sure he had access to VA benefits. And I always think of his case um, as someone who experienced a lot of trauma early on in his life, in his formative years, and how that would impact the care he was trying to access later in life, mm -hmm. and how reluctant he might be to go to a, psycho a psychologist or another, form another therapist, mm -hmm. given the experience he had with therapists mm -hmm. early on, um, how likely he would be to even go to the VA or access benefits provided you know, in his connection to his military service. So I think the, the key thing that we think of at SAGE is to make sure to understand the full scope of people's experiences and how that can inform how they interact with the aging network later on in life. Um, one thing I just want to make sure to bring up at some mm -hmm. point today is yes. that we just launched, and I see Terry from HRC here uh, uh, in the audience, a long-term care equality index uh, with the Human Rights Campaign. And this will be uh, a way for LGBT folks across the country to look at, basically look at a directory of long-term care institutions and to see which ones of those have LGBT cultural competency training, among other factors that would factor into whether someone wants to choose a setting like that. So kind of not related to that question, but I just wanted to make sure to, to get that out there uh, uh, today. Yeah. I guess it's one. Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Dan Grimm from uh, Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield. 
And we've talked a lot about roles that um, providers have played, um, facilities have played. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about some best practices you've seen from the health insurer or the health payer um, mm. sphere about how they've mm. been able to support LGBT individuals in the end of life. Well, one thing that I, I hear come up quite a bit, you know, is people talk about the, when we do training, so we're doing training with frontline staff, SAGE trains people, insurers though play a powerful role in either helping people feel valued and seen or potentially exposed and vulnerable, particularly when it comes to patients whose gender identity does not necessarily align with the sex assigned at birth. And so, you know, in terms of a best practice, for insurance companies to show flexibility when they're generating a bill and sending it to someone's home to make sure that the name on that envelope is the name that person uses. Because it, when you're sending mail, particularly to someone who was you know, assigned, let's say assigned male at birth, they identify as female now, you may out them and make them vulnerable to not only discrimination, potentially violence, just by something that seems as simple and small as the name on an envelope. So I would say a best practice, insurance companies, don't be wedded to how your data systems work and generate <laughs> things. You could actually save people's lives by showing a little flexibility. Yes. Blue shirt. Good morning. Tim Agar with the Northern Virginia Regional Commission. Um, in speaking to the conversation before about compound discrimination, um, aging, LGBTQ issues, and HIV are linked, mm -hmm. unfortunately, perhaps, mm -hmm. as we approach Stonewall 50. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you see the, the parallel lines of um, addressing these issues in uh, advanced care mm. uh, playing out? Mm. If I'm not being clear about my question, I guess, um, as we experience discrimination for LGBT folks, many of which are, are trans, MSMs of color, uh, how are we going to address or be able to address this dual challenge um, that we're facing for aging adults? I mean, I think it's really important, um, and I see lots of friends in the room from HRC, I see uh, Sam McClure from Chase Brexton, formerly with the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce, and I know we've had a lot of uh, conversations uh, about this. It's so important for us to uh, offer some context uh, to practitioners, uh, uh, many of which are in the room, um, to the folks that are researching these issues. Uh, you mentioned Stonewall 50. You know, this is the 50th anniversary of Stonewall. Uh, and it's a tremendous milestone for the community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not lost on me, it's not lost on us at AARP that, you know, there's a whole generation of LGBTQ folks that never expected to make it to 50. Mm -hmm. And there are systems and structures that didn't expect them to make it to 50 either. And so we're all playing a game of catch up. Mm -hmm. um, we're all sort of reimagining what are we gonna do with this, this time. Uh, and in order for folks to understand that context, we gotta tell stories. Uh, we've gotta do a look back and a look forward. Uh, and so we've invested a tremendous amount of resources um, in uh, collecting stories and working with partners to elevate stories, particularly uh, with some attention to uh, folks from traditionally marginalized groups, you know, women, folks of color, trans men and women, gender nonconforming people, um, you know, how can we elevate their story so people have a better sense of the context uh, in which we're all working in? Um, we have uh, just a few minutes left. I wonder if there um, is a question from Facebook that we've heard. No? Okay. Um, that's fine. Yes. I just have a question about language. Mm -hmm. um, we are um, particularly good with these euphemisms about life-limiting illness, mm -hmm. um, all <laughs> these words that we use. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time that I've heard somebody say dying from something. Mm. 
<laughs> so I was wondering if this is a choice, is this, if it's an empowering choice for mm -hmm. you, and if this is something that you see as moving forward, empowering people, living and dying yeah. Yeah. from one of these illnesses. Yeah, you know, I think it's interesting. I think, um, you know, talking about compound discrimination and things, all of us have different lenses through which we see ourselves in the world. You know, I'm, I was a daughter, I'm a wife, I'm a mother. You know, I have all these sorry, different roles and, um, and, and perspectives on the world. And one of the perspectives I have now is, you know, as someone who is dying. And so, you know, I hadn't thought about it as empowering, but I, I think it probably is because I've accepted it. If I hadn't accepted it, and I think this goes back to, you know, even being gay. You know, Kim talked about um, she was way more out than I was. You know, I knew who I was, and I was out to everyone, everyone knew me knew. But, um, but it has to do with how much you accept it. And it took me longer, I think, to accept the fact that I could be who I was out in the world. And if you have a problem with it, that's on you. It could end up hurting me. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's a potential for violence or other things that could happen, but that's really you. So being out is about accepting myself. And I, my guess is, based on your question, that for some people who may not have the same acceptance of end of life issues, because I've been working in the field for 30 years, you know, it is empowering. And in, you know, if you lived in our house, you would probably be appalled because, you know, we make jokes about it all the time. Kim in the hospital, this, if you've read the updates, you've seen this talked about how I don't have hand cancer. I could pick up the phone and call someone myself. And the reality was, I could. I was just feeling like, I don't feel and good. She I don't wanted want to, do to order her ice cream. Can you call and order me I ice cream? I was like, <laughs> the yeah. phone was right next to me. I right. could do it myself. And she was right. right. And, but, and we joke about that. And we have so many jokes. And even Gray will say, oh, you know, um, you know he'll, he'll make a, a comment about whether I'll be around then. Or, right. and, and, you know, and then, and then he'll get, he gets sad. And I'm not saying we don't get sad. But by using the word, we're not denying that it's happening. Right. You know, and I think that's the problem when we as healthcare professionals shy away from the word. We are saying to you, I'm not sure, you, I, I don't want to tell you you're dying. Right. I don't want to admit you're dying. But, but I think we need to let go of the euphemisms to the extent that we can to make it more accepting. And again, that's why we're... We're doing what we're doing. You have yeah. thoughts? Oh no, I was just thinking when we um, when we found out that it was clear cell um, and mm -hmm. not just garden variety regular ovarian Bad cancer. Ovarian cancer. Um, <laughs> we were on the phone together. I was out on a hike, and mm -hmm. we were conferenced in with the oncologist, and we were trying to get a sense of prognosis. And I asked it like 42 different ways. She did. And at one point, she goes, "Oh, you mean you mean you're you're asking about her dying?" <laughs> I was like. Yes, that's what <laughs> she I'm was asking. Going through all these things she about was studies like, and right. Uh, so I think we're so in healthcare, we're so not used to talking about it. There's no shame in dying. Um, there's no, there shouldn't be stigma around it. It's not we're, my fault. We're still getting used to trying to figure out how to break the news to people. We were at, <laughs> we were with people from our Quaker meeting at a camping thing uh, two weekends ago, and someone said, "Oh my God, Kathy, you're eating gluten." She has celiac. Did something change in your life? And Kathy goes, well, I'm dying, so I can eat gluten now. And the person didn't know she was sick, and it was, it was. It was, it was a little better than that. Was, but, but we're getting used to trying to have to it's soft to pedal. People. How do you tell people? Because people get sad, and then you're managing their <laughs> sadness. And, and it's like, wait, bad. I'm the one dying. <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to tell you. So I think we're just not used to saying dying. Yeah. So yes, I think it is empowering. Um, and it's also the reality. Yeah, it's a great question. I think that I'm, we're out of time, actually. Um, so thank you all very much. Thank the panel very much. For a little bit, if you want to say hi or, or chat, yes, but I appreciate your time and attention today. Thank you.